snowing outside, a perfect day to catch up on some reading. And where do I go when I need to do some reading? I go right to the Bible because the Bible always grows me in many ways, many and just amazing ways. The Bible is sharp and, and it's powerful. It says that it cuts to the depths of my heart and tells me who I am and what it is I need to work on and what decisions I need to make. And in the midst of uh, life right now, in my life of some big decisions, this is the only counsel that I seek. And the Bible helps us to decide where to go, the decisions we need to make. And I'll start this teaching off in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. It says, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land of the Lord, swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was hundreds of years before the story we'll talk about now. As I was reading through the prophet Jeremiah, we're coming up to the point in time when Israel has, a, has sinned too much. They've just quit. They've forgotten to choose life, and they have therefore chosen death. And because of that, God is sending the Babylonians to take them into captive, to take them into exile. Jeremiah, in a little earlier time, has said, look, you have a choice. You can come out of the city, give up to King Nebuchadnezzar, and live or you can stay inside the city and you can die. You have the choice between life and death. Same choice. It's the same point. God said, if you follow my words, you will live. If you give yourself up to me, you will live. If you go on your own path and do it yourself and do it in your own power and not go against, and go against my word, you will choose death. So we come to Jeremiah chapter 40. And Jer Jeremiah chapter 40, actually Jeremiah chapter uh, 38. <clears throat> I'm going to bounce around a little bit. It's a four or five chapters of really good reading, but I just want to make the point of the story in this short teaching. Zedekiah is now one of the la is the last king of Judah of of the southern part of, of Israel. Israel has been split into the northern Israel and southern Judah. That happened a number of kings ago. The northern kingdom of Israel has already been swept away by Assyria. They no longer exist other than some Jews in the land and some Sumerians that came down and some other people that have come in. And so everybody's just kind of intermingled. They're not really a nation anymore. But Judah still holds on. They hold on for a few hundred years past. Zedekiah is the final king of Judah. Jeremiah is the prophet. And Jer Zedekiah has been watching all these things that Jeremiah continues to say, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Everyone keeps saying, no, you're wrong. No, you're a liar. Maybe we should throw you in jail. Maybe we should kill you. But now Zedekiah is facing the fact that his city is now surrounded by the Babylonian Empire. And they are trying to siege the city. It takes two years to siege the city. And people inside the city are dying from hunger and, and, and from pestilence, from disease, of sanitation problems. All of this. All this was already told about by, by Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, give yourself up to the Babylonians and live or stay in the city and die. And a lot of people are dying. Well, here's the king. And the king comes and says, verse 14, One day King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah, and he had brought to the third entrance of the Lord's temple. I want to ask you something, the king said, and don't try to hide the truth. Jeremiah said, if I tell you the truth, you will kill me. And if I give you advice, you won't listen to me anyway. And so King Zedekiah secretly promised him, as surely as the Lord our creator lives, I will not kill you or hand you over to the men who want you dead. Interesting that Zedekiah hasn't listened to a thing Jeremiah said, but he makes this oath 
against the word of God, against the God's name. It says, as surely as the Lord, our creator lives, I will not kill you. That's a promise. That's an oath on the name of God. Um, um, he hasn't really followed God until this moment when he's trying to sound religious. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, this is what the Lord God of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. If you surrender to the Babylonian officers, you and your family will live and the city will not be burned down. But if you refuse to surrender, you will not escape. This city will be handed over to the Babylonians and they will burn it to the ground. There is your, there's the same choice. Give yourself up life. Stay in here, death. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Give yourself to the Lord Jesus, life. Stay in your own sins and your own self and don't believe in Jesus Christ, death. We'll keep going. Verse 19, but I'm afraid to surrender, the king said, for the Babylonians may hand me over to the Judeans and have defected to them, and who knows what they'll do to me. Jeremiah replied, you won't be handed over to them if you choose to obey the Lord. Your life will be spared and all will go well for you. But if you refuse to surrender, this is what the Lord has revealed to me. All the women left in your palace will be brought out and given to the officers of the Babylonian army. Then the women will taunt you, saying, What fine friends you have. They have betrayed and misled you. When your feet sank in the mud, they left you to your fate. All your wives and children will be led out to the Babylonians, and you will not escape. You will be seized by the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned down. And Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, don't tell anyone you told me this, or you will die. <clears throat> so Jeremiah goes to Zed Zedekiah comes to Jeremiah, and he says, look, tell me what's going to happen. God says, if you give yourself up, you will live. If you stay in here you will die and the city will be burned down. Now, I have to believe what Ze what's Zedekiah thinking? Everything that Jeremiah has said since day one of his ministry that started in the first three verses of Jeremiah have come true. He has watched them. He has been convicted. He has been angry. He has put him in jail. He has convicted him to death. He has saved him because the Lord said to save him. I, I don't know where's I don't know where Zedekiah's mind is here. Here, but it isn't with obeying the Lord. And we find out there this way. Here's when we find out. Chapter 39, verse 1. In January of the ninth year of King Zedekiah's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came with his entire army to besiege Jerusalem. Two and a half years later, on July 18th in the eleventh year of Zedekiah's reign, a section of the city will be broken wall was broken down. All the officers of the Babylonian army came in and sat in triumph at the middle gate. <clears throat> when King Zedekiah of Judah and all the soldiers saw that the Babylonians had broken into the city, they fled. They didn't give themselves up. They fled. They waited for nightfall and then slipped through the gate between the two walls behind the king's garden and headed toward the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian troop chased them down and overtook Zedekiah on the plains of Jericho. This was not, the, this was not Jeremiah's rule. Jeremiah said, give yourself over to the king of Babylon and live. Stay in the city, run away, do whatever the Lord is not telling you to do, and you will, you will, have, you will seek and face consequences. They, um, we will even use the word judgment, as you'll see here in a minute. They captured him, Zedekiah, and took him to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who was at Riblah in the land of Hamath. There the king of Babylon pronounced judgment, judgment, upon Zedekiah and the king of Babylon made Zedekiah watch as he slaughtered his sons at Riblah. The king of Babylon also slaughtered all the nobles of Judah and then he gouged out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in bronze chains to lead him away to Babylon. Meanwhile the Babylonians burned Jerusalem including the royal palace and the houses of the people and they tore down the walls of the city and Nebuzardan the captain of the guard took as exiles to Babylon the rest of the people who remained in the city. So judgment has happened. God said, this is going to happen. This is what's going to happen. If you give yourself over to the Babylonians, you will be taken to Babylon, but you will live. If you fight, you will die. Now, interestingly, 
Zedekiah doesn't listen. He doesn't he, he sounds Christian. He sounds believable. These aren't Christians back then. They're Israelites. But, but by proxy, the same issue is now, it's, we're now Israelites are not God's people. The Christians are God's people. Although Israel still has a place and a time to be handled in the uh, coming up in the tribulation where the Jews will finally turn back to him and see that Jesus was their Messiah and they will be lofted to their excellence because God is not done with Jewish, the Jewish people. Don't be, don't be faked out by replacement theology that says that God has turned his back on the Jews. It's not true. Throughout the whole Old Testament, as I've been reading the Old Testament, he says, I will never turn my back totally on the Israelites, on the Jewish people. Those are my people and my promises are true. So he gets caught on the way to running away. The only way, reason why he is left alive is that Jeremiah earlier told him, you're going to, the only thing God's going to keep you alive because you're a pretty good king and you actually kind of followed after him, even though you weren't as good as you should have been. So Zedekiah finds himself in trouble, but look at what happens to Jeremiah in verse 11. King Nebuchadnezzar had told Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, to find Jeremiah. See that he isn't hurt, he said. Look after him well and give him anything he wants. So Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, a chief officer, Nergel Sherezar, the king's advisor, and the other officers of Babylon's king sent messengers to bring Jeremiah out of the prison. They put him under the care of Gedaliah, son of Ahakiakim, and grandson of Shaphan, who took him back to his home. And so Jeremiah stayed in Judah among his own people. Because Jeremiah is, is, is working for the Lord, the Lord told him that he would protect him throughout all of his ministry and all of his life. Even as he comes under difficult times, God's hand was always on him. And my question as I was reading this was, how does Nebuchadnezzar know anything about Jeremiah? Well, as I was doing my research, he, he did it. God just put it on his heart to save a guy named Jeremiah. And here he is. God can do anything if you will only obey the Lord. He told Zedekiah that. You will be okay if you serve the Lord. Jeremiah gave his whole life in the service of the Lord. And so he moves on. The Lord gave a message to Jeremiah after Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, had released him to Ramah, and he had found Jeremiah bound in chains among all the other captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being sent exile to Babylon. The captain of the guard called for Jeremiah and said, The Lord your God has brought this disaster on this land. Interesting that this Babylonian man is calling upon the Lord God and saying, It was your God that told me to do this. Interesting. For these people have sinned against the Lord and disobeyed him. That is why it happened. But I am going to take off your chains and let you go. If you want to come with me to Babylon, you're welcome. I will see that you are well cared for. But if you don't want to come, you may stay here. The whole land is yours before you. Go wherever you like. If you decide to stay, then return to Gedaliah, son of Ahiakim, and stepson of Shaphan. He has been appointed governor of Judah by the king of Babylon. Stay there where the prophets uh, and the people he rules, but it's up to you. Go wherever you like. And then Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, gave Jeremiah some food and some money, and they let him go. And so Jeremiah returned to Gedaliah, son of Ahiakim and Mizpah, and he lived in Judah with the few who were still left in the land. <laughs> They're all being exiled to Babylon in punishment for not believing in the Lord. But Jeremiah did believe in the Lord. And so, so Nebuzardan goes and finds him and says, he says, look, you... I'm going to let you go. I've been, I've been told by Nebuchadnezzar to let you go and take care of you. You can go anywhere you want. I'm going to give you some food and some money. I'm going to bless your, and you can stay in the land. It's up to you. God has given you that freedom. There is freedom in the Lord. If you follow his teachings, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe that his son has died for you and your sins, then you will no longer be subject to being taken away in punishment. You will be left in the land. 
really being left in the land means being taken to heaven and coming back to earth for a thousand year reign with Jesus and to live on the earth for eternity, to stay in God's land. That's the, that's the awesome part of this. <clears throat> so Gedaliah is the governor now of Judah. And Gedaliah has been told to take care of Jeremiah, and he does. He's a, he's a really nice guy. He takes care of the people, and he rules them very kindly, and everybody's doing really well. But always when someone is kind, the devil always has a response. Soon after this, Johanan, son of Keriah, and the other military leaders came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. They said to him, did you know that Baalias, king of Ammon, has sent Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, to assassinate you? But Gedaliah refused to believe them. Later, Johanan had a private conference with Gedaliah and volunteered to kill Ishmael secretly. Why should we let him come and murder you? Johanan asked. What will happen when uh, then to the Judeans who have returned? Why should the few of us who are still left be scattered and lost? Ishmael has a, or um, Johanan has a good point here. The Bible tells us that in, the, in numerous counselors, there's safety. When good reason comes to us and says to do one thing or another, and you hear it from multiple sources, it's probably a good idea. And Johanan, who is a Jew, most likely working for the Lord, has come to him and said, by the way, someone's looking to kill you, but Gedaliah, who isn't of the Lord, blows it off. He blows it off. He comes back to him a second time and says, why should we all be scattered? You've been such a good leader. Let me take out the problem before it happens. But Gedaliah said to Johanan, I forbid you to do any such thing for you are lying about Ishmael. And I don't know what the relationship between Ishmael and Gedaliah is, but he doesn't believe in Johanan's counsel, just like Hezekiah didn't believe in Jeremiah's counsel. We're talking about the decision. Listen and live or reject it and die. Well, in chapter 41, Gedaliah dies. He is assassinated by Ishmael. It exactly happens exactly the way it was supposed to happen. And so the military leaders, including Johanan and son of Ezra, uh, Jezaniah and Hosina, all the people from the least to the greatest approached Jeremiah the prophet. So now that their good leader's gone, and we're worried about Babylon because all these people came in and killed the leader he had put in into office. They go to Jeremiah to seek counsel. They said, please pray to the Lord your God for us. As we can see, we are only a tiny remnant compared to what we were before. Pray that the Lord your God will show up and what to do and where to go. All right, Jeremiah replied, I will pray to the Lord your God as you have asked, and I will tell you everything he says, and I will hide nothing from you. Jeremiah is a great prophet. Why? Because he does not pull punches. He does not sugarcoat. He doesn't leave it out. He tells it, and he's spoken to. He's told at the beginning of his life, you will tell people what I tell you and nothing more. And so Jeremiah has been a faithful servant up until this point. These people know this because everything that, Zed uh, everything that Jeremiah has said has now come true. You would think that in counsel, in good biblical counsel, there is safety. Well, let's keep reading. And they said to Jeremiah, may the Lord your be faithful witness against us if we refuse to obey whatever he tells us to do. Whether we like it or not, we will obey the Lord our, your God, our God, because they're Jews, to whom we are sending you with our plea. For if we obey him, everything will turn out well for us. Ah, good thinking. Let's follow what Jeremiah says, because Jeremiah speaks the word of God. The word of God is proven to be true. So what he says, we will be good, and we will be taken care of, and we will be all right. So 10 days later, the Lord gave his reply to Jeremiah. So he called for Johanan and son of Korea and the other military leaders and for the, all the people from the least to the greatest. And he said to them, you sent me to the Lord, the God of Israel, with your request. And this is his reply. Stay here in this land. If you do, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you. For I am sorry about all the punishment I have had to bring upon you. 
Do not fear the king of Babylon anymore, says the Lord, for I am with you and I will save you and rescue you from his power. And I will be merciful to you by making him kind so, you will, so he will let you stay here in your land. God has said, stay in my will. Stay in my land. Stay here. I'll take care of you. I will make the Babylonian king kind so he doesn't bring it against you that, that, that Gedaliah is dead. Just stay in my will. But, God always has a but, but if you refuse to obey the Lord your God, and if you say, we will not stay here, instead we will go down to Egypt where we will be free from war, the call to arms and hunger, and hear the Lord's message to the remnant of Judah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. If you are determined to go to Egypt and live there, the very war and famine you fear will catch up to you and you will die there. That is the fate awaiting every one of you who insists on going to live in Egypt. Yes, you will die from war, famine, and disease. None of you will escape the disaster I will bring upon you. Here's God again. If you choose to stay in my will, you'll live. If you do your own thing and you go to Egypt, you will die. You will die from the, the very one thing you're trying to escape from, Babylon. Here's a point about Egypt. Egypt is a picture of the world. Remember that Moses pulled the Israelites out of Egypt. And when they brought him out of Egypt to the land that he wanted to show him, he brought him out of the world, the world system, the world culture, the world idolatry, all the world wickedness, and brought him into a place that would be like heaven, pulling him from, from a place of the world to a place of godliness. That's where this is. They're trying to return back to the world, not listening to God's word, but going back to the world system where they feel their IQ and their intellect and their understanding can get them past that. It's not going to work here. God has given them another choice, live or die. This is how it ends. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Just as my anger and fury have been poured out on the people of Jerusalem, so they will be poured out on you when you enter Egypt. You will be an object of damnation, horror, cursing, and mockery, and you will never see your homeland again. Listen, you remnant of Judah, the Lord has told you, do not go to Egypt. Don't forget this warning I have given you today, for you were not being honest when you sent me to pray to the Lord your God for you. You said, just tell us what the Lord of your God says, and we will do it. And today I have told you exactly what he said, but you will not obey the Lord your God any better now than you have in the past. Ouch. But Jeremiah speaks the truth. He has never withheld his punch. And so you can be sure that you will die from war, famine, disease in Egypt, where you insist on going. And when Jeremiah had finished giving this message from the Lord their God to all the people, Azariah, son of Hushayadah, Johanan of Korea, and all the other proud men said to Jeremiah, you lie. The Lord our God hasn't forbidden us to go to Egypt. Baruch, son of Neriah, has convinced you to say this because he wants us to stay here and be killed by the Babylonians or be carried off into exile. And so Joe Johanan and the other military leaders and all the people refused to obey the Lord's command to stay in Judah. Johanan and the other leaders took them with them, all the people who had returned from the nearby countries to which they had fled. In the crowd were men, women, and children, the king's daughters, and all whom Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah. The prophet Jeremiah and Baruch were included. The people refused to obey the voice of the Lord, and he went to Egypt, going to as far as the city of Taphanes. And of course, from right here, God then drops judgment on Egypt. He sends Babylon, Babylon into Egypt and wipes out the Jews that are there, wipes out everybody else that is there, except for Jeremiah, because Jeremiah is a man of God. He is delivered from the, the siege in Egypt. Here's the thing. <laughs> this Bible gives us our direction. This Bible gives us our marching orders. 
from the very beginning to the very end of the Bible, from the very beginning of history to now, God's word has been true. It's never been proven to be wrong. If we are all like these guys who said you're a liar and we go back to the world, then we're in trouble because we're not listening to God's direction. God's direction is the only way to go. It's the only place to go. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it is one that I will not deny. In Isaiah, it says that he stands behind us and tells us which way to go. That we could get onto the highway of holiness, as it's talked about. The highway that leads us directly to Jesus, directly to, to being to being delivered from our sins and from this world and from judgment. Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to face judgment. But you have to come out of the city. And you have to come out of your own sins. And you have to come out of your IQ and your understanding that you think you got it all figured out. You have to look past being a Christian and be a disciple to understand what the word is. You must be born again. You, the Spirit must rest upon you as you repent from your sins. You know you're different and changed when you change. Come out of the city. Give yourself over to Jesus Christ. He will take you to a better place. But don't go to Egypt because you will be destroyed there. God's word is faithful and it has never changed. Why, why would we all stand around and not believe that the words that have already happened aren't, aren't faithful for the rest of them that haven't happened yet, but are starting? There's no reason to turn away from these sins. There's no reason to turn away from these fears to, to question God's word. God's word is faithful. Look, my prayer for you is that you would get away from this silly IQ thing you've got going on, to believe that you've got it all figured out, to just kind of call yourself something, but don't change your life. The Bible says you need to have faith of a child. A child believes in everything. He believes in unicorns and rainbows too, but believe in Jesus Christ. It is real. He is real. I can tell you as he moves in my life and he has changed me for the better. One, I know that God's word is true and faithful. His promises will be carried out in my life and I'm seeing them now. I know that Jesus has died for me to secure my salvation so that I can go and I can go into heaven and be with him forever. I know the Holy Spirit has come upon me to lead me and guide me, to speak behind me and tell me which way I should go. It has changed my heart forever. And the fourth way to know that I am saved, it is my love for other people. Apostle John says, you'll know that you are saved. You know that you are the elect of God by the way that you love your neighbor. And who is our neighbor? The next person sitting next to you, no matter who it is, whether it's your whether it's a family member or your wife or a best friend or the neighbor next door you like or the guy down the street you despise. We're all supposed to love one another. And the Spirit will help you do that. It is the, that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Maybe everybody here on earth could use a little more of that right now. He puts in front of you and I put in front of you right now a choice death or life blessings or cursings choose life there's not much time left watch the news things are crazy and as prophecy starts to continue the church will be pulled out of here the Holy Spirit will be pulled out of here and if you don't think you can follow Jesus now what makes you think you can follow Jesus in death when the Antichrist comes for your persecution and your beheading it says so in Revelation and that word is true just like everything else in that book go in peace today seek the Lord while you still can and we all love you we're praying for you Come to his table. He will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. He does, not, he does not despise or reject anyone. These are the true words of Jesus Christ himself. Blessings.